Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. Now, this doesn't have anything to do with my sermon, but just a little bit of trivia for you in lieu of today's lessons. And we learned it at our men's Bible group. Do you know what manna, the word, means? What is it? So if you never knew that before, manna means what is it? But that has nothing to do with it. <laughs> well, well, thank you anyway. So let's share the text together that we are focusing on this morning, printed in your bulletin. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you, so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. Thank you. So from our lesson this morning, it looks like St. John may not be the best of Lutherans. He may not have been a very good Lutheran. And I say that because of all this talk about bearing fruit, doing good works. It doesn't necessarily fit in with your typical thought of Lutheran theology, does it? Now, a Lutheran fruit stand, in speaking about religious fruit, is thought to have just the stand. The fruit bins would be empty of fruit because we don't need it. And they'd be filled only with grace. That's what we typically think of with Lutheran theology. And in fact, in the year 1517, when Luther began this long Reformation road journey, he was accused by his opponents and other reformers that he preached against good works. They accused him of preaching against God-pleasing activities as a requirement. There were a lot of religions that did have required works at that time. One of them, the Roman Catholics, had a litany of works. You could do penance. You had to do penance. You had to do Hail Marys. Our Fathers. And lastly, the pinnacle of religious work, become a monk. Dedicate yourself 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year, and be a monk, praying, worshiping God, the pinnacle of work. Now, Calvin had works he required as well, a little bit different. But for Calvin, altars needed to be stripped, any adornment whatsoever that, was, that would decorate the church had to be taken down because we needed to focus on God and God alone. And Calvin also preached that we had to live pious lives, completely blameless before God. Extremely, uh, and set ourselves as extreme examples of flawlessness. Zwingli, although closest to Luther's theological viewpoints at the time of Reformation, preached works as a requirement for salvation. King Henry VIII works. Now all of these Reformation fathers insisted on works as necessary activities, which were demanded to show one's faith and obtain a right standing before God. So they have, Luther's opponents asserted that he had flawed theology because he failed to acknowledge necessary works for faith. Their fruit bins had to be full. And if they weren't, then you have no salvation. And that's what they said of Lutherans. Your fruit bins are empty. You're not going to have any salvation. And Luther did, in fact, have issues with works. And focusing on one's own life story in the story of salvation. Now think about our Lutheran signature verses. Does anybody happen to know what those are? Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, right? So those, good. So those say, for by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God. Not a result of works so that no one may boast. Those are said to be the pinnacle of Lutheran teaching. The Augsburg Confession asserts that point when it says, and this is from section 26, in the first place, the grace of Christ and the teaching concerning faith are thereby obscured. 
The gospel holds these things up to us with great earnestness and strongly insists that everyone regard the merit of Christ as sublime and precious and know that faith in Christ is to be esteemed far above all works. For this reason, St. Paul fought vehemently against the law of Moses and against human tradition so that we should learn that we do not become righteous before God by our works. But that is, it is only through faith in Christ that we obtain grace for Christ's sake. Such teaching has been almost completely extinguished by the instruction to earn grace with prescribed fasts, distinction among foods, dress, etc. The key points of that section, faith in Christ is to be esteemed above all works. St. Paul fought vehemently against the law of Moses and human tradition. We do not become righteous before God by our works. That's what the Augsburg Confession says in that brief section. Works are no good. But is that what our Lutheran confessions say in totality? Terry and I go to Dinuba every Sunday. And I go at least once a week. And I don't know how many of you have made that drive down Mountain View out to Dinuba, but you should. It's a pretty nice drive. <coughs> Along the way, there's a multitude of fruit stands. You can get anything you want as far as fruit and vegetables, cantaloupe, watermelon, peppers, tomatoes, all kinds of farm products. So take that imagery and picture that drive and envision those fruit stands are stocking religious fruit. You pull up to one and they're full of speaking in tongues. You have to speak in tongues at that fruit stand, otherwise you're going to get thrown out into the street. Pull up to the next stand, and there you have to use your voice to sing to the angels. You can't have musical instruments because they detract from your relationship with God. Then you pull up to the next one, and it's a Lutheran stand, and it has a sign which says, you don't need any fruit. For it's by grace you're saved. If you're, if you're like Terry and I and are searching for fruit, would you come back to the stand that doesn't have any? Or would you continue to go to the stand that does bear fruit? As for a religious fruit stand, is God going to stop at the fruit stand that has no fruit? The Augsburg Confession, after that section I read earlier, goes on to say this. In addition... It is also taught that all are obliged to conduct themselves regarding bodily discipline, such as fasting and other work, in such a way as not to give occasion to sin, but not as if they earned grace by such works. Luther's opponents were wrong. We do bear fruit. Lutherans are expected to bear fruit. It's just not any kind of fruit that can earn you grace. Lutheran called, Luther, Luther called this theology two kinds of righteousness. And that's what we believe. Two kinds of righteousness. Passive righteousness says this. It's a gift from God. Everything we get as far as forgiveness, grace, mercy is from God. There's nothing I can do to earn that. I can't buy it harder for it or anything else. All I can do is receive as a gift. Those verses that support that passive righteousness, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, our pinnacle verses, for by grace, it is by grace for which you are saved, not by works, lest any man should boast. And then, also, that passive righteousness comes in our verse for today. You did not choose me, but I chose you. By God's grace, we were chosen. God chose us by sacrificing his son, Jesus Christ. Sending him to a cross where he was crucified, died, and was buried. And then on the third day, he rose again for our salvation guaranteeing us eternal life. In that, it doesn't matter how much fruit is at the fruit stand. What matters is that you acknowledge you're a sinner 
unworthy of God's mercy, but because of Jesus, you're clean and white as snow and perfect in God's sight. Passive righteousness. God to us. in the story. But Luther called it two kinds of righteousness. The other is active. Passive and active. This is how we interact with the world until Christ comes again. For active righteousness, we can say, when you pull up to a Lutheran fruit stand, there are some expected fruits to be filling the bin. Fruits that won't earn your salvation or a good standing before God, but they are expected nonetheless. Now, can you guess what the fruits are? There's a list of nine of them. Anybody? Do you know which book it comes out of that I might be referring to? <laughs> what is it? Galatians. Yay, good job. What, um, what verse? Does anybody know the verse? By chapter 5.22, okay? So Galatians 5.22 gives us a glimpse at these fruits that we can expect from a Lutheran fruit stand. And really, I don't mean to single us out like that, just making a point since most of us here are uh, Lutherans. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Fruits of the Spirit. Two kinds of righteousness. From God to us, and from us to each other. And people everywhere. Lutheran theology. Ephesians, our pinnacle verses, don't stop at verse 9. It goes on a little bit further. For by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it's the gift of God. Not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Passive righteousness. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Active righteousness. Our verse this morning. You did not choose me, but I chose you. Passive righteousness. And appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last. Active righteousness. God loves us so much that he chose to love us through his son Jesus Christ and he desires us to show that love to others. He desires us to grow daily in faith. He desires us to show his forgiveness of our sins. He desires to show us his forgiveness of our sins in Holy Communion. He desires us to see him in his word, to receive the spirit in baptism, and to receive Jesus' true body and blood as communion, in communion as believers. That is what needs to fill our Lutheran fruit bins. And when we fail, we have Jesus who loves us. So I want to take a look at our fruit stand right here. 1084 West Bullard. From the people who greet you when you walk in, the people who serve in music, ushers, leaders of ministry teams, people serving on ministry teams, and all those who attend worship here, we are bearing fruit through those activities. One large piece of fruit growing on a tree is the support that's been given to this Guatemala mission team. That has been amazing support from all y'all, as they would say in Texas, I think. The support has been overwhelming. The finances have been overwhelming. And it's also that this group can plant a seed in a foreign country. Hopefully you feel really good about that. Because you're, you're moving mountains even though you don't see it happening. 
Now, there's only eight people going, but I want to reiterate the fact that you are a part of that fruit. We're just representatives going to plant. And there, there's a little bit more that I want to point out to this verse this morning. It says, bear fruit, fruit that will last. The trip this time is a starter. Hopefully, we will be able to continue and continue to bear fruit that lasts. And not just in the Guatemalan trips, because I don't know that we'll do that again. We'll see. But at least in your serving, you're doing a good job. Keep it up. Fruit is being, is, we're bearing fruit every day, and it's lasting. So we're about to commission this team going to Guatemala, and we're leaving a week from tomorrow. We're going as Redeemer's representatives. And as I said, it's because of all of you that this is being completed. So, dear friends at Redeemer, I just want you to know we do have a fresh fruit stand. We can boldly proclaim fresh fruit, get it here. And God responds, well done, good and faithful servants. May God who loved us enough that he did not spare his one and only son give you his peace which surpasses all understanding and may it guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus.